This is InfoSec Decoded, number 72, Critical Thinking. And we're starting with Irvin, who's got Cobalt Strike. So the register has this thing. Uh, some research has been going on about uh, people using Cobalt Strike. And lo and behold, people are using the same cracked version everywhere. Apparently, when you install Cobalt Strike for the first time, it creates a, a key pair. And whoever cracked it has just been sharing that same key pair everywhere. So a quick look into things like... Thieves who don't even bother to regenerate the key. Like, there's just no honor. Yeah. No. Yeah, they're just using it as is with the same key. Uh, they looked into... Uh, Talos looked into um, uh, Virus Total and found the same key pair in a lot of Cobalt Strike stuff. Oh, well, Cobalt Strike is expensive, and you're actually supposed to, I think, demonstrate some evidence that you're not a crook. So I guess the crooks would pretty much have to use the stolen version. Yeah. So I'm sure they'll find a way to shut down any, any bug using that key. That's it. I saw they had some IOCs here, so you can put it in your... Uh, your filtering solutions. Yep. Yep. Well, yeah, I, I've wondered about it. It's too bad. You know, Cobalt Strike costs too much. I can't use it in class, but everybody says uh, Metasploit is the open source alternative, and we certainly use that. Yeah. But Cobalt Strike has all these fancy features, and it would be nice to practice with it, but uh, there is no free version, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. All right. And Alan, I thought this was great, the uh, critical thinking. Tell us about this. I've heard of it, and I never really understood it. <laughs> well, uh, this is a paper, an academic paper, written by four um, professors of psychology in France, the title of which is Maybe a Free Thinker, But Not a Critical One. High Conspiracy Belief is Associated with Low Critical Thinking Ability, which may seem like a really obvious observation that people who believe in wacky conspiracy theories like QAnon um, obviously um, uh, are not thinking clearly, shall we say, if we're being very polite here, um, that they are somehow intellectually susceptible to believing really outlandish claims that to most people just, um, well, do not pass the sniff test. Well, I'm not sure I'd agree about it being most people, as far as I can tell, it is approximately half of America that now believes this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, and to be fair, in previous generations, it was like 90% of them believed in stuff like demon possession and magic and stuff. So I think it may be the natural, healthy human mind that is extremely likely to believe this stuff. Maybe you have a good point there. It, yes, maybe there is something to be said about um, the just the ubiquity of a conspiracy theory, turning it into something that's no longer a conspiracy theory, but a widely held misconception. Well, see, one thing that bothered me when I read the DSM-3 years ago is they said that failure to accept your society's traditional religion is a sign of mental illness because it shows insufficient, you know, acceptance of the rules of the, of the culture. So believing just what's in the air around you is like natural herd conformity. And I think that's what happens to the Republicans. Enough of them have believed this that now they all just accept it. Hmm. I, I wonder how the DSM then would uh, accommodate uh, atheism. As a sign of abnormal socialization. I, and I, I mean, in a society that doesn't like atheists like America, where I think studies have shown for my entire lifetime that most Americans would much rather vote for a member of any religion they hate rather than an atheist for president. Oh. It's like the most hated religious group. <laughs> that may be changing now. I remember some people said to, um, when Donald Trump won, I was thinking, boy, finally an atheist in the White House, but I, this is not really the way I wanted it. Anyway. Uh, yes, that's true. Donald Trump is probably the most atheist of all presidents, even if not a professed atheist. He is, and somehow I'm not happy, you know? <laughs> Although, and I forget the exact figures, but um, more and more people are identifying as atheist yeah. in surveys. Uh, and more and more people are identifying as spiritual, but not affiliated with any church. And uh, certain uh, groups such as um, 
uh, evangelical Protestants are losing numbers, as are Catholics also. Yes, except but, on the Supreme Court. Yes, um, but at any rate, with this particular paper, the authors claim, and I have not had the time to verify this, but the authors claim that they are the first to have conducted a comprehensive study based on the uh, relationship between critical thinking abilities and a susceptibility to believe in conspiracy theories, which um, is, uh, is surprising in a way because conspiracy theory studies is not a new thing. Uh, there are a number of academics who actually examine this or specialize in this. Um, but apparently nobody's actually bothered to look into the critical thinking reasoning abilities of people and their apparent uh, susceptibility to conspiracy theory thought. And what they found or what the authors claim is that people who uh, have lower critical thinking ability are indeed more susceptible to uh, conspiracy theory thinking, for the lack of a better term. But if you, which is kind of a, a nice thing to know, so it, it, it ties this up with a nice, nice and tidy bow. But if you read through the 38 pages of this uh, paper, it becomes clear that the correlation is really much, much weaker than they would uh, have you believe based on the title alone. And if you dig into uh, some of the, uh, the numbers, they have, for example, a scatter plot um, showing all the uh, uh, 200 plus um, participants oh. and how they figure on um, the axes of uh, critical oh. thinking ability. Oh, you're not kidding. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It just looks like a shotgun blast hit the page. There's like That's no, right. no trend at all. No trend at all. So really they're using quite a lot of statistical manipulation to support this hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and, and it's very interesting. Some of the, the participants who scored the highest on critical thinking also scored the highest on susceptibility to a conspiratorial thought or conspiracy thinking. So yeah. I don't know if this is really a very convincing argument for um, some kind of correlation between critical thinking and uh, conspir conspiracy theory thinking. One other interesting point is in their review of previous studies of other literature, um, they cite another study which observed that there is no correlation between fluid intelligence and uh, belief in conspiracy theories. What is fluid intelligence? Fluid intelligence is, uh, there, in this conception of intelligence, there's fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence is the ability to synthesize novel insights um, whereas crystallized intelligence is, for lack of a better term, like book learning, the um, distillation of previous learning. And so fluid intelligence is the ability to like do really well on an IQ test, for example, which is supposedly, uh, is, is, uh, or at least in some parts of it, um, discounts. Uh, crystallized intelligence. It, it purports to identify people who perhaps do not have a lot of book learning, but have some kind of innate ability to synthesize insights based on, I don't know, their, their mental acuity, shall we say. So one is storage and the other is processing. Yes, you could say that. You could yeah. say that. Now, of course, there are elements of storage and processing in the other two, but yeah. at any rate. Yeah, so that was a very interesting observation that people who uh, have very high, can score very high in fluid intelligence, can also believe in conspiracy theories. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been in cults and I've thought about this. And the one thing I, that magicians have always found, like Uri Geller, is that the smartest people are the easiest to fool. Mm. And I think I understand it from my personal experience. Smart people are predisposed to believe that I know more than everybody. 
And it's perfectly fine if I believe something and I know that 99% of everyone else doesn't believe it. Why, that doesn't mean I'm wrong. That just means I'm right again and they are all fools. <laughs> you are only, you're predisposed to believe that if you have a high intelligence. And in fact, it is frequently the case like in math class that I am right, even though most people don't see it. So, I mean, that's, that's what I found. Mm. And I think that's, at least in my experience, that's what all this stuff is based on is ego. I mean, if you, I was talking to a right-wing friend about this recently, who had the usual conspiracy theories uh, to tell me about. And I said, the thing about this stuff is it's easier to listen to because it tells you that you're fine. Whereas if you listen to like a real science lecture or a real news report, you will feel stupid. You'll say, oh my goodness, I don't really understand this. And these other people are more educated and knowledgeable about it. And now I feel inferior. And that's a bad feeling. So it's more fun to listen to a conspiracy theorist who tells you, you know, the experts are all just on a conspiracy lying to you. And the real truth is what matches your preconceived notions. Mm. And you are now special by believing this, uh, that this, you, you finally see through how all the people with those science and math books and government are all just part of a conspiracy to confuse you. It's not like they really know anything. They're just lying. Mm. That's an interesting observation because uh, one thing I notice in a lot of this discourse about QAnon is that the, the, the believers in QAnon have a very strong anti-elitist and anti-intellectual streak. Yeah. Um, and anti-intellectual in that they, they um, are adamant that if you just look, uh, if you go down the rabbit hole, then all the information you need is there. You don't need to listen to the mainstream media and you most certainly don't need to listen to the so-called experts that this information is comprehensible and available to anybody who's willing to just take the time and look for it. And it doesn't require any kind of, well, quote unquote, book learning. Well, when I was a kid, there were people that said, everything you need is in the Bible and you should not go to college because all it will do is corrupt your mind and take you away from God. And, um, they, and of course, they, you could say that's true because then they would learn critical thinking and then they would begin to question the, the traditions. So and well, I, think, yeah, I think it's always been with us. Yes, although as, as we see in this study, perhaps critical thinking doesn't actually do much good when it comes to well, <laughs> inoculating people against conspiracy theory beliefs. Well, I know education doesn't either. My, a lot of, you know, everybody I think now is facing this. They have relatives who believe this QAnon stuff. And my friends who have highly educated relatives say they're highly educated relatives believe this stuff. Mm. It is an urgent issue for us to have some way to address the fact that half of our culture is going mad on us. And, you know, I think what we're living through is an experiment, whether it's possible to have a multicultural democracy. And the right wingers believe it is not. And everybody needs to be white and Christian. So we have a monoculture democracy. And everybody who won't adapt to that is like held in a second place. And that's the old fashioned way cultures ran. There was an official religion, an official master race, and everybody else was inferior. And therefore, they're all on the same page and they all agree about stuff. As we can see, the Democrats don't agree on anything. They bicker among themselves because they're just a loose coalition of people who don't really conform. And the idea that they can actually run a government is kind of untested. We're, we tried it from 65 to 2013, having a multicultural democracy, more or less. And now our society is very strongly considering just retreating from that back to a monoculture. Or an apartheid. Well, sure, that's what you have. You have an apartheid. You have a dominant race, and the rest are just held down and forced to conform. That's the old-fashioned system, and that's what the Republicans want. Well, I have to say, in light of this study and uh, a lot of other discourse surrounding QAnon and conspiracy theories and some of the trends in, in uh, political discourse and thought these days, I, I'm beginning to think more and more that um, these are not problems that are solvable through better education or no. through more intelligent discourse or through persuasive arguments. Yes, and, but another thing I think is really important to realize is it's not like the conspiracy people, like QAnon people, are a different kind of person. Like there's something wrong with them you could treat. They're just normal humans placed in an environment that brings out that side of them. I remember I used to feel when I was a child like something must be terribly wrong with the Germans. How could they possibly become Nazis? We would never do that. It could never happen here. And now that is obviously not true. And there are so many of them doing it. It's not that they're all crazy or stupid or anything. It's that 
they're in a group and they're just conforming to a group like fish forming the flock you know they're doing what's expected in their group and you look at people like adam kinzing are getting thrown out of his own family for daring to question what donald trump says they they most of them are there because that's what they need to do to fit in their family and their culture and everything expecting them to rebel against all that would be like betraying their fundamental beliefs so i don't know what we're going to do yeah but I think this is another evolution of the American experiment, which I think we're kind of living up to our founding fathers that said, we're going to create this new thing that is more people governing and more democratic than what has come before. And we're going to see if we can make it work. Yes. Well, or not work as the case may be. And we'll find out. Yes. And I think, and now I'm reading more people saying that in fact, while we have been fighting among ourselves over here, the Chinese have been racing ahead in fields like AI and the fact that we don't actually like focus on something and work together, we're really beginning to lose. And I believe that's probably true. We really need to get our act together here, but I don't know what could possibly do it except a war with an external attacker that we all hate even more than we hate each other. And I guess that would be China. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think they're volunteering for that, but they are getting closer to it. Well, may it never come to pass. Well, uh, I don't know. It might be the best thing. I mean, I'm not really recommending it, but this is the scourge of God. This is the ancient thought is that societies need to have a war now and then to like straighten out their, their idiocy. Anyway, um, we'll see. Maybe we can do something better. Anyway, so I got this. Uh, we have Voyager is out there. Voyager was only supposed to, there's two Voyagers, and they were only supposed to last five years. And they've lasted a lot longer, but they're powered by plutonium. And the plutonium is just decaying, and they're going to run out of power soon. They're going to have to start turning off the instruments. So eventually, it'll just be a dead hulk drifting out there. So now they're trying to design the next interstellar mission. And they want to make one that will last for 100 years. And they're trying to think of some way to keep it powered for that long. So you need a better internal power, or they need to like shine bright lasers from Earth that go all the way out there and send power to it. And the, the thing that uh, this article from NPR is talking about, which is very interesting, is they say now we're having to deal with the fact that our technology goes obsolete so fast. We're going to have to archive equipment from now to be used 100 years in the future, the ancient version of computers and stuff, so we can still talk to that old device out there. And we're going to have to somehow pass the institutional knowledge from the programmers and mission designers we need to pass it on to the next generation. And that's the issue of technical debt, which is big at all these companies, like, I, well, another thing that came up a while ago is how many companies have one spreadsheet in Excel written by somebody who left 10 years ago, and the whole company relies on that sheet, and nobody any longer understands how it works. This is actually quite common. And this, and they're, they're trying to make plans to move the technical information onto future generations inside NASA. So anyway, I think it's they're they're facing a very interesting issue. So they so they haven't discovered this thing called a wiki. Well, I don't think a wiki is the solution, but it might be. That's the issue. I mean, this is a it's an interesting issue. And I remember there's Star Trek episodes about this, about how some culture who relies on some equipment and nobody anymore remembers how to fix it or maintain it. We're kind of headed for that. <laughs> anyway, it's on my cobalt. Right, right. There's some people who have abandoned the joy of COBOL. <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, that's, that's that's very fair culture. That's, in fact, a fair statement. Yeah, a whole bunch of our society runs on COBOL, and the number of people who understand how to maintain it is very small. Yeah, anyway, so I thought that was interesting. And let's go back to Urban, who has got Best Buy. Best Buy, Home Depot, and Lowe's are dropping two Chinese companies because they are tied with the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm and the abuse on them. Uh, Best Buy is still selling the one of the two, and actually they put it on sale. So it looks like they're trying to get rid of those, those devices. The other companies no longer have it listed on their sites anymore. So the fact that the Chinese government uses it for an immoral purpose makes them not want to sell it here. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I would do that. I mean, if the government, by how is the company supposed to stop the government from using it? <laughs> it's a moral thing. Well, yes, I'm not very impressed by the morals. I had a similar issue. I was 
I was invited to teach classes in a Mideastern nation. And some people said, you should refuse to go there because they're not moral enough. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, there are students there that need to learn stuff. It, anyway, it's an interesting issue. But I mean, if you're going to have a Chinese company, they obviously have to sell to the Chinese government, let the Chinese government do whatever they want with it. The same thing's true in the U.S., right? You sell something right. to the U.S. government, it uses it to build drones and spy on people and run our illegal torture camps in other nations and stuff. I mean, what are you supposed to do? How yeah. do you stop your government from so, using your stuff? Yeah, so this, this move is kind of half-fast because uh, another company, DJI, who makes drones, yeah, isn't being blocked in the same way by those same companies. Yeah, yeah. So I, they're kind of picking and choosing. I think this is what they call virtue signaling. You just don't want to be associated with a bad brand. And uh, it doesn't necessarily pass uh, through the test of actually thinking through what you're accomplishing here. But increasingly, we're having like boycotts and uh, embargoes against Chinese goods as the US and China adopt a more and more hostile Cold War attitude towards each other. I'm not sure that's a good thing. <laughs> anyway. And me either, but there you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it's interesting they're doing it. And all right, now Alan's got the FBI's guide. There's an article in Vice magazine written by Joseph Cox um, about a uh, slide presentation from 2019 that has now been released under the Freedom of Information Act. And this is from uh, an FBI group called the Cellular Analysis Survey Team. And uh, this, this uh, slide deck contains information, some of which is not terribly surprising. You know, just it talks about the FBI's surveillance capabilities um, using uh, cell phones and uh, the FBI's ability to get information from the cell service providers. And what is interesting about this report are a couple of slides that um, list out the data that these uh, providers are keeping and how long they keep that data. So for example, um, at and uh, more than all the others is providing data such as call detail, detail records and um, the cell sites that its subscribers are using, that is to say the cell, cell phone towers um, there's, they're storing this data for seven years um, versus other companies such as T-Mobile, which is mostly keeping similar data for two years or not at all, uh, and Verizon, which is keeping that sort of data for only one year. So it turns out that there are huge differences in the data retention policies or practices of the different providers, and that some of them, such as AT&T, are really holding on to this data very for very, very long times. And it's not entirely clear why, other than to aid law enforcement, such as the FBI, or maybe they have their own reasons for uh, studying patterns or even monetizing this data. Whereas others, such as Verizon, are keeping this data for uh, much less time. That said, there aren't really a lot of compelling reasons for any of these companies to be storing any of this data for very long. I mean, some of it, of course, yes, it uh, might be helpful for them, as I said, for tracking the user behavior and for improving their services. But a lot of this, such as um, um, storing uh, video or voicemail for very long times, not just for the user, but accessible to the company, there aren't a lot of good, strong arguments for them doing this. Uh, so it's something to look into a little bit more, shall we say. Yeah, and I'm not surprised by this. I mean, AT&T did the warrantless wiretapping. Um, AT&T is basically a branch of the government and always has been. And by the way, so is Microsoft. Both of them are very, very much going along with anything the US government wants in close partnership, as opposed to pushing back like these other companies. Yeah, so I wonder if that's the, the main reason why they've got this, this such a, um, uh, they're, they're holding on to the, the data for so long. But then again, uh, AT&T, although it has significant market share, there are a lot of other uh, providers out there too. And uh, 
it's interesting that the FBI, the government, the NSA hasn't leaned on those companies to hold on to their data a little bit longer. Well, I don't think they can directly lean on them. I think probably the question is how much the government is your primary customer. Mm. <laughs> yes. And I think both Microsoft and at and the government is their primary customer. So they just conform with whatever the government wants. Yes. So for anyone who's concerned about this, I guess the answer is go to Verizon because Verizon is at least somewhat better than the other companies when it comes to data retention. It, it might be. Yeah. Often, often you can't find enough information. Like I remember a lot of people want to use VPNs, but the latest scandals about VPNs suggest that if you use the popular VPNs, you're actually handing your data over to the crooks you were trying to hide from. Right. Cape Technologies, which uh, has sold malware in the past, sold and operated malware. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Now they run an anti-malware. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, um, then I've got the ring, this Aura ring. O-U-R-A, I don't know how to pronounce it, which I heard about Kara Swisher's wearing one just sort of modern mood ring, but apparently it's getting smarter. And I didn't know this about smartwatches. The Apple Watch monitors your oxygen level as well as your pulse. And this is going to have predicting your period if you're a woman having periods. And um, so it is actually, I'm beginning to think I should get one. I mean, this actually keeps track of a lot of health information. And so you can monitor your exercise and your fitness and whether you're like suffering oxygen deprivation at night from sleep apnea and a lot of things. And at some point, these wearable health monitors are going to be so valuable that it's really worth getting one and you can actually like improve your health with it. So I'm interested. Um, I know that the real serious athletes have been using these things for about a decade, um, but I didn't think it was uh, necessary to get one is just an ordinary human, but now I'm beginning to think maybe it is getting to be about time to get one, even if it's just an ordinary human. Anyway, and then uh, Urban has got TikTok. TikTok and a few other companies are going before the Senate, uh, Snapchat, and YouTube, uh, the Senate Commerce Consumer Protection Subcommittee. Uh, the one of the issues that they want to discuss is that devious licks thing where kids would go into the bathrooms and destroy it. Devious. Oh, oh, whoa, oh, where they're tra trashing high schools. Yeah. Yes. Trashing high school bathrooms and bullying and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, yeah. TikTok was one of the ones who was who tried to be fast enough to block the hashtag or to just not show anything. Uh, to me, it's it's a cat and mouse game. This all generation of kids do this. They find a fad, they go for it. The parents try to block it and then they find another way around and the cycle just repeats. Well, yeah, but just like we were saying, now apparently because of YouTube and Facebook, the paranoid conspiracy theories have greatly multiplied to be much more of a problem than they used to be. So it may be that the malicious uh, trends in, in idle destruction have grown much faster than they would have in the past. I guess, but good luck trying to stop all that. It always happens. Well, it reminds me a lot of, of saying that uh, pornography or video games are going to ruin your kids, which they've been saying forever uh, without much real evidence. Either of those things are true. Yep, yep, yep. But I think there's no question that um, targeted advertising and targeted recommendations have, in fact, greatly harmed our culture. That I would agree. So anyway... What I think, however, is that the whistleblower at Facebook is now blocking out the sun and no other tech investigation is going to get any energy. Everyone's going to focus on hating Facebook for about the next year. That, that whistleblower stuff is, uh, is just a huge dump. And they're using it to make a whole endless series of horrible articles about everything bad Facebook is doing. So I think TikTok and everybody else is going to get a free ride for a while. Yeah. All right. And uh, then Alan has got the Lambda School. The Lambda School, which is one of the now many, many coding boot camps out there. They've been around for not very long. I think they started out in 2017 or 2018. Uh, they really burst onto the scene with some huge funding rounds. Got a, uh, I think they've received over $110 million in funding, which is just bonkers money for a school that apparently is not doing very well. 
because uh, Business Insider is reporting on some internal slide decks from some presentations uh, held within the company internally in the past year. And these slide decks reveal that um, Lambda School is doing far worse than they are claiming, in particular in the area of student placements. So students go through the boot camp, they graduate, quote unquote, uh, and then they are supposed to receive assistance from the school in getting placed into Facebook or Google or some very prestigious coding job out there. And they have claimed, Lambda has claimed recently that the placement rate is 74%, which is quite good that three quarters of the students are getting a job within yeah. six months, getting a job in coding within six months of graduation. However, internally in, their, uh, in these leaked documents, they are acknowledging that the average placement for students within 90 days of graduation is only 16%. And within 180 days, that's only 27%. Oh. So they are grossly inflating this placement. And on top of that, um, they've been facing a lot of criticism because of their payment structure. Unlike a lot of other schools that require you to pay about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars up front, um, Lambda does what's called an income share agreement in which they will take 17% of a student's wages after they get a job. And- uh, For how long? First year or something? For two years. For two years, okay. Yeah, yeah, and this is to pay back the loan, so to speak. Well, it might be a good deal if you get a job, I don't know. Well, that's exactly the thing. It might be a good deal if it actually works. And what's becoming clear is that it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, um, I talked on this podcast some months ago about a lawsuit that's been brought by some former students who- These people uh, who don't get a job, they don't have to pay, right? Well, they, <laughs> uh, that's the principle, yes, is that they don't get a job. But the, 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 the problematic area is those students who get enough of a coding job to qualify for uh, the requirement and yet it's not much of a coding job. So the, the way it works is that they have to get a coding job that pays at least $40,000 a year. And so if you are a Lambda School graduate in the San Francisco Bay Area getting paid $45,000 a year in some kind of not quite a full-time job, you know, it's like kind of part-time or yeah. uh, <laughs> as a contractor, um, then you're going to have to pay them 17% or excuse me, the $17,000 based on this ISA. And what's also becoming more and more of a theme with Lambda Group is more and more students are coming forward and saying they are not actually teaching us anybody. They made promises about having really good classes, structured classes with teachers yeah. who would provide uh, tutoring and it turns out that they don't do this. They don't offer this. So the students at this point are being expected to essentially teach themselves. In this article, students are quoted saying that uh, there's very little teacher supervision, that the students are being uh, told to just click on these links if they want to find out more, and then to talk amongst each other to figure out the problems, which is not really... Um, a comprehensive education program, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. I know that's there's some coding boot camps that work that way, but they don't charge us kind of money. Right. There are plenty of free boot, uh, coding boot camps out there that uh, offer more or less the same structure. Yeah. Um, but $17,000 for this, uh, oftentimes students who uh, don't have the ability to pay the $17,000, that's a big ask. And if yeah. they're not holding up their end of the deal, if Lambda's not holding up their end of the deal, then really the, the, this is behavior that's more consistent with a failing startup uh, than it is an educational organization. Well, well uh, I think you get a better deal going to community college, especially since it's free. <laughs> yes, yes, especially in San Francisco. Yeah. 
but um yeah that's they advertise that their classes are a whole lot better than what you'd find at a community college and i'm not convinced that's true no and we've certainly had students at city college who've come to us after having gone through these boot camps and i've talked to them and they said it really did not work out for me they were not good programs i did not do well in them and that they just they were trying to move too fast yeah uh, and the quality instruction was poor i've had them they even came to take my class at the same time they were taking this other one mm. <laughs> so they could actually like get some help and stuff <laughs> yeah. yeah well yeah well i that's why we supposedly this is what accreditation committees and everything are supposed to actually be doing something about and maybe that stuff and lawsuits will do some good here Anyway, uh, the, so the last one here gets us back to disinformation. The, the Guardian says 60% of Americans say oil firms are to blame for the climate crisis. And I read, looked at that and I said, well, who on earth are those 40% who don't think that? And of course, it's the Republicans. It is in fact 90% of Democrats that think that global warming is happening, but only 40% of Republicans think it's happening. And only 28% of Republicans think that the oil is responsible for it. So it's, uh, this is what Donald Trump said, you know, there is no global warming, it's all a hoax right out of China to suppress our industry. And, uh, you know, I got, I got right wing friends that think the earth is cooling, not warming. So it's, uh, it's back to where Alan was <laughs> back to where we, we keep going the huge problem in our society, we've got uh, a bunch of people that just don't live in a rational world where science matters and vaccines cure diseases and all kinds of things. And it is uh, hard to know how you can uh, hold a culture together and progress when you've got an anchor and a bunch of people going backwards. Anyway, um, I got no immediate solution. I'd like to think in the long run, education will help, but I don't think it's gonna work in the short run. Anyway, uh, I guess that's it. And what is it, Tuesday, we'll be back Friday. Farewell.